Thank you, and thanks to all of you for coming to he hear me, among others, today. Uh, as you know, I'm going to talk about killings across the U.S.-Mexico border uh, for the sake of variety, and not merely because I've never learned how to use PowerPoint. Uh, I'll be talking without PowerPoint. Uh, we are all aware of the crisis of excessive use of force by police against African-American citizens in our cities. Uh, it's a major civil rights issue. Uh, in technical constitutional terms, it involves the Fourth Amendment guarantee against unreasonable seizures of the person uh, and the Fifth Amendment guarantee against deprivation of life without due process of law. Uh, but there's also an ongoing problem of excessive use of force by the Border Patrol against people of color at or near the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, sometimes the victims are already in U.S. territory, uh, but sometimes the victims are just across the border in Mexico. Is this not a civil rights issue uh, because the victims are not citizens? Uh, is it not a constitutional issue because when they are not citizens and not inside the United States, the Constitution does not speak to this issue? Uh, I have been writing about the extraterritorial effect of the Constitution uh, for over 25 years. Uh, this issue has lately been raised again in the concrete case. Some of you who read the New York Times on Sundays will have uh, read about it, uh, of a Mexican teenager in Nogales, Mexico, uh, who was killed by a Border Patrol officer firing through the famous border fence. Uh, this spring, I wrote an amicus brief in the case brought by his mother. The case is called Rodriguez versus Swartz, and it is now before the Ninth Circuit uh, and possibly headed to the Supreme Court later. In the 19th century, it would have been possible to say without too much exaggeration that law is inherently limited to the territory of the sovereign and that the Constitution, therefore, has no effect outside the borders of the United States. Uh, in the 21st century, this is so obviously false that we need different answers to these questions. Courts and scholars have been debating this issue since the Second World War, which is around the time when the uh, extraterritorial uh, establishment uh, and exercise uh, of power uh, by the United States became commonplace. Uh, for now, essential guidance comes from the 2008 Supreme Court decision on the Guantanamo detainees. Guantanamo Bay Naval Base is technically outside the borders of the United States. Uh, in Boumediene versus Bush, uh, the Supreme Court held that Congress had unconstitutionally deprived the detainees at Guantanamo of the right to habeas corpus. Justice Kennedy, who wrote the majority opinion, uh, used the occasion to explain more broadly that extraterritorial application of constitutional rights depends on what he called a functional approach that takes into account three different kinds of factors. One is facts about the status of the individual. Uh, the second is the nature of the locations where the relevant acts took place. Uh, and the third is the practical obstacles that would prevent enforcement of the right in the particular locations at the relevant time. These factors are considered together uh, to decide whether it would be on balance not feasible to apply the constitutional right for the benefit of the individual at that location. Kennedy offered this analysis as the best explanation of the court's precedence over the course of the 20th century. Uh, in doing so, Kennedy united a majority of the court behind his functional approach and rejected the idea that rigid formal rules should settle the issue. Uh, the dissent in that case argued in favor of rigid rules. There should be no constitutional rights for foreigners outside the United States, period, and therefore no right to habeas corpus at Guantanamo. Uh, 
Uh, the dissent relied in part on a 1990 case, United States versus Verdugo Urquidez, uh, where the Supreme Court had held that the Fourth Amendment did not apply to the search by drug enforcement agents of a Mexican drug lord's house in Mexico. Uh, in that case, Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote an opinion arguing that non-citizens needed to have significant voluntary connections to the United States uh, before they could have constitutional rights, and that the drug lord's illegal connections didn't count as significance. Uh, Kennedy, however, wrote separately in that case, and he sketched an earlier version of the functional approach that he later set forth in the Boumediene opinion. Uh, for me, one central achievement of the Boumediene case is the repudiation of the significant voluntary connection theory of Verdugo. Uh, the United States should not be able to capture or kidnap people abroad and then say, they have no rights because their connection to the United States is not voluntary. That was the position of the Guantanamo detainees, involuntary captives, uh, but the court said they had a right to habeas corpus. Uh, unfortunately, the lower courts have been slow to apply Boumediene's functional approach to other constitutional rights in the eight years since Boumediene was decided. Uh, some judges are uncertain about what its implications are, and some judges are hostile to Boumediene and prefer the rigid rules that it rejected. The killings across the border uh, present an important test of constitutional principle. Uh, reckless firing by Border Patrol agents is intolerable, but does it violate constitutional rights? Uh, in the Rodriguez case, the victim was an unarmed 16-year-old uh, and a Mexican national. The location where he died was a street in Nogales, Mexico, that runs along the border. The agent was firing from Nogales, Arizona, through a slit in the 20-foot steel fence from a position of strength and with access to institutional support. Uh, we aren't talking about a war zone, uh, but about everyday border enforcement. Uh, if Mexico and the United States were at war and it was necessary to fire to keep the United States from being invaded, the Boumediene analysis would treat the locations differently uh, than it treats ordinary states of affairs. Uh, as for obstacles, there is no practical reason identified why the Border Patrol can't observe the same limits on the use of lethal force in the cross-border situation that it uses on the U.S. side of the border. Uh, taking these factors together, the fundamental protections of the child's life under the Fourth or Fifth Amendment should apply. Now, in the actual case, at the trial court level, uh, the trial court ruled in favor of the victim, uh, but it considered additional facts about the victim before it found that he was protected by the Fourth Amendment. Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora are two organically related communities divided by the border fence. Uh, the victim lived in Nogales, Sonora, but his grandparents lived in Arizona as lawful permanent residents, uh, and the victim lived only a few blocks away from the border. The grandmother frequently crossed the border to care for her grandchildren while the mother worked. It seems, however, uh, that the victim had actually never been in Arizona. Uh, he may have been too poor to get permission to come for a visit. The trial court found that these facts established a significant voluntary connection between the victim and the United States, sufficient even to satisfy the Verdugo case, and therefore that the Fourth Amendment uh, applied. I could support that conclusion, uh, but in my view, it shouldn't be necessary. Uh, residents of Nogales who don't have grandmothers in Arizona should also have the right not to be murdered by Border Patrol agents. Uh, under the U.S. Constitution. 
Uh, Mexicans on less inhabited segments of the border should have the right not to be murdered by Border Patrol agents. Uh, law enforcement that affects universal rights should be governed uh, and limited by the Constitution. We'll see over time how the courts respond. Thank you.